Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile Life, the podcast. This is episode 205 called Kristen. Today's episode is presented by Belly. Belly offers modern prenatal vitamins optimized for fertility, prenatal, and post-pregnancy health. To learn more about how to optimize your fertility and pregnancy health, check out their vegan-friendly, dairy-free, non-GMO vitamins for both men and women at bellybaby.com. That's spelled B-E-L-I-B-A-B-Y.com. The best part, if you use code Alley 15 you'll get 15% off your first month of either Belly Women or Belly Men. Again, that's code Alley 15 A-L-I-1-5 for 15% off. Thanks, Belly. Okay, guys, so my guest today is Kristen Marsoli, a loyal Target shopper, as am I, an aspiring novelist, and a cancer survivor. Knowing she couldn't carry a baby because of her medical history, when Kristen and her husband were ready to start their family, they turned to surrogacy. So after a long journey with many bumps in the road, they finally welcomed their beautiful son in 2014. And in an interesting plot twist, Kristen then turned her personal experience with surrogacy into her profession. She is now the marketing director at Circle Surrogacy, where she educates intended parents, surrogates, and egg donors about surrogacy and egg donation through their marketing efforts. And she's super passionate about helping make parenthood possible for others. So we're going to talk about all of this today, as well as what song was number one in 2014. Do you guys remember? You'll find out. Without further ado, this is Kristen's infertility story. All right, Kristen. Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm well, Allie. How are you? Good. I'm so glad we're finally getting to do this. We've been working together for a long time because you work at Circle Surrogacy, who I have worked with for years now, um, since the beginning of the podcast. But I'm so happy for you to finally share your own story. So as I always do, let's start at the beginning. Did you always want to be a mom? So I don't know that I always wanted to be a mom. So I think if I think back to when I was young and I was an only child, I had a lot of dolls. Okay. I would play with my dolls, but I was never their mom, which sounds so strange, right? Like I was their teacher or their aunt. And I honestly started to think like, I don't know that I have the mom gene. Like I was, I was never the little girl who was like, I can't wait to be a mom. And I don't know. It's that I didn't want to be a mom. It just was not sort of at the forefront of my mind. Mm -hmm. So I think it wasn't until I was married, which we'll go into because at that point I knew I couldn't have kids. Okay. And that's sort of when I wanted to have kids because I think I was finally at the right place in life and sort of settled career-wise, married. And I was like, yep, now's the right time. And of course, at that time, it was too late. (laughs) Okay. So when did you, it was it before you met your husband that you found out that there was going to be some problems? Can you, or some issues building a family? Absolutely. Okay. Um, So we're going to go way back. Let's go go way back back to way back. back. This is going to, the podcast is going to age me here. So it's 2004. Okay. I am living in Boston Mm -hmm. and that was the year that my now husband and I got engaged. We got engaged in March of 2004 we were, he was finishing up some school. I was working at an advertising agency. Um, we were living in this cute little row house in South Boston um, before it was cool to live in South Boston, still a little gritty. And we, I was, we were in the throes of planning our wedding. So it was around October of that year. We had been engaged for about six months. And I noticed like something just was off. Like I've always been super in tune with my body And I was just experiencing some things and I'm like, "Mm, I think I need to go to the gynecologist. What were you experiencing? So it was just like, not necessarily like pain, but there was just like abnormal sort of monthly type issues that I was not used to having. Had you ever had that before or was this the first time you realized it? First time. So I went to the doctor <clears throat> and they were like, hmm, 
there's some abnormalities going on here. You know what we can do? We're going to just do like a little quick, you know, biopsy and I'm sure everything is going to be fine. So they do a little biopsy and um, spoiler alert, everything wasn't fine. So they said, you know what? Like, we think we need to look into this a little bit more. We're going to send you to Brigham and Women's Hospital and they are going to do a larger biopsy that you have to go under for. It's just a day surgery. Don't worry. So we go to do that. And of course, you know, this is when you start just dreading, right? Like you just think the worst, but I was trying to remain optimistic. And I'm like, you know what? Like, this is going to be the thing that says, hey, everything is fine. Right. So we go for the day surgery. Um, It was very quick. Um, That was when I learned I am not able to come out of anesthesia because they were like literally mopping the recovery room floor and it was dark and they were like, you got to get her out of here. Like I could not wake up. Really? Is that a thing? Like a regular thing? It's a thing. It actually is a regular thing for me. I was going to find out. So we have that quick day surgery. And honestly, they were like, you can go back to work tomorrow and go on with your life. Wait, how long were you out? I think, honestly, I think the procedure was like a half an hour, but I honestly think I was out for like two hours after. Like I just could not wake up. It was just crazy. And then did you feel crazy? Like when you did wake up? I was out. I was so loopy. Yeah. I was like, this is, this is not good. Wow. Went home, slept it off and then went back to normal life as they said. But of course, you know, you always have that little thing kind of in the back of your head. And then a couple of days later, it's, I was, I had gone to work. I was a little tired. I wasn't really feeling very well. So I asked to kind of go home early and, you know, I notoriously have a horrible memory, but I remember this moment like it was yesterday. I was sitting on my couch. I had our two little dogs with us. I was watching Oprah there we go. There's, oh there's God, the dating I right there. Oprah. I know. I, I just, know. I just was curious what the number one song is in 2004. So I just Googled it. Do you have any idea, like any guesses what the like oh, year man. end number one single was? I have no idea. What was it? It was Yeah by Usher featuring Lil Jon and Ludacris. <laughs> And oddly, I still love that song. Oh my God, I love that song. I love that song. (laughs) Um, So there I was watching the queen, Oprah. She had Rupert Everett on. I remember that. And I remember thinking, God, he has so much makeup on. Like they had so much makeup on him. He's sitting on the couch talking to her. (laughs) Random thought. And I know. And my landline rings. Okay. And... Before I even answered the phone, I knew who it was. I knew it was the doctor. And I picked up the phone and she was a lot more eloquent than what I'm going to tell you that she said to me. But all I heard was, hi, Kristen, you have cancer. Like literally that's what I heard. She obviously was talking about stages and abnormalities and she's sort of going through this whole spiel. And I like it's like tunnel hearing. Right. Um, you know, I just like really focused on that and I was like, Oh my God, you know, Mm -hmm. and sort of towards the end of the call, she was sort of talking through what next steps might be. And it was, you can have, you can undergo either like radiation and we can try to sort of like treat this. And the other option is surgery. Okay. What kind of cancer was it? It was cervical cancer. Okay. So sorry. Yeah. So, and it had, yeah, and it had spread and whatnot. So lymph nodes and, and all that good stuff. So I remember I hung up the phone. I was alone. And I think during the entire ordeal of everything sort of that we went through with this, that was the first of only two times that I ever cried. I literally hung up the phone and I just like collapsed on the floor and I just, and I just cried it out. Like it was just, I just, I had to get it out of my symptom. And of course I have like the two little dogs that are like, what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. So had to get that done, picked myself up, called my then fiance who was at work. And like, I was like hysterical. I'm like, can you come home? You have to come home. And I didn't want to tell him on the phone, but I also realized that I probably scared the bejesus out of him, like Mm -hmm. crying on the phone, telling him he needed to come home. Mm -hmm. Um, So he comes home, sort of tell him what's going on. And we sort of, honestly, after that, it was a very quiet night and just sort of talking through what our options were. And, you know, I was 30. We were about 
a little under a year away from our wedding, Mm -hmm. you know, working. And honestly, the last thing in my mind was, I'm not going to be able to have kids after this. The first thing in my mind was, get this out of me. Yeah. Had they mentioned anything about your fertility? They did not. And I think, honestly, I think, well, they did. And they didn't say, hey, you know what a good idea would be? Like, you should freeze your eggs. That was just not a conversation that was happening back then, really. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I did opt to do the surgery. So the surgery had a horrible name. It was a radical hysterectomy. Oh, wow. That is a horrible name. I know. And so basically, they remove everything except your ovaries. Okay. Okay. So it's like the opposite of a hysterectomy, basically. Okay. And the only sort of preservation that my doctor, who was a phenomenal gynecological oncologist at Dana-Farber, I was so lucky to be living in Boston at the time. I had the Mm -hmm. best care and the best treatment. Mm -hmm. The one thing she did say is, I'm going to pin your ovaries up when I'm in there doing your surgery, just in case you need radiation or chemotherapy in the future will sort of get them out of the way so that they're not affected. Interesting. And I think, <clears throat> yeah. And I think part of the reason, you know, for leaving the ovaries, obviously for eggs, but also just to not put me into premature menopause. Right. Okay. So yeah. So but they didn't um, mention freezing your eggs at this point. That's so interesting, yeah. Kristen. Okay. I know. That and, a lot has you know, changed it's one, since then. Oh, hasn't, I mean, you know, to go back to my younger self, right. To go back to my 30 year old self, I would be like, freeze your eggs. Right. But it's like, you Um, don't know what you don't know. And if people aren't talking about it or wasn't presented to you as an option, how do you know that you're supposed to do that? Exactly. And, you know, I mean, we were not really thinking about kids yet. You know, I mean, we were 30 to our, in our minds, we were still so young. So young. Um, I mean, you're dancing to Ursher at the club at this point. (laughs) Exactly. Like how can we have kids if we're still at the club? <laughs> so we opted to do the surgery. And it was again, it was back in the day. Um, so it was a very invasive surgery. I was in the hospital for a week after. You know, now they do it laparoscopically, um, which is great for everybody now. But I'm like, damn, I wish it was laparoscopic back then. So I was in the hospital for a week and it was, it was such a a weird time. You know, it was just feelings of, I just want to recover. Um, I was in a lot of pain and, you know, the staff at the hospital was just phenomenal. My doctor got me a private room and honestly, they were just, they couldn't have been nicer. And I think, you know, I think they understood more bigger picture of what was going on with me than I did, Mm -hmm. where I was just like, great. I'm alive. And, you know, good news is when they tested all the margins and whatnot, like they had gotten all of the cancer, it hadn't spread any farther. So that in itself was just good news. So it was sort of us just like living in that good news, just trying to take it day by day. Um, My recovery time was two months. I had to take two months off from work Mm. and I needed all two months. Like, again, like it was, it was a big surgery. Mm -hmm. I had no strength. I lost Mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Um, Were you in a lot of pain? uh, I was in a lot of pain. So the second time I cried during this, it was, it was probably the day after we got home. I was on the couch. It was very hard to get comfortable and I needed to get up. And I couldn't get up off the couch by myself without Mm -hmm. screaming in pain. And Mm -hmm. I just think I just cried out of frustration. Yeah. I can't even just get up. Like I tried to roll over. I didn't have, you know, in the hospital, you had like the bars on the bed that you can sort of roll onto and pull yourself up. And then all of a sudden I was on this low, probably Ikea couch in a living room. (laughs) A hundred (laughs) percent Ikea. Right. 2004. Yeah, exactly. Nothing to hold onto. And I'm like, I can't, I can't even get up. Like I can't. So it was a lot to get through all of that. I mean, you know, it was, it was a big recovery. And, you know, my mom came up to Boston, stayed, you know, for the first week with me. Um, My husband, my then fiance, now husband was phenomenal. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I was just so grateful for the support and the love because honestly, like we weren't married yet. 
Right. You know, so I mean, this was a big thing for for somebody to take on. And, you know, he had his future to think about. Yeah. Right? Like, like technically he could have bounced. Right. He could have. <laughs> he didn't. And that's why he did he's it. so amazing. Oh, no. Um, mm-hmm. But he didn't. So, right. <clears throat> yeah, so obviously recovered. We got married. Right. And then I would say it was probably we got married in 2005. I would say it was around 2008 where we started to think, hmm, I think we want to grow. I think we're ready and Mm -hmm. I think we want to grow our family. Okay. So did you, what did you know about having babies at that point after your surgery? Like, were you going to have to go through assisted reproductive technology for sure? Or could you try naturally still? Or like, no, because I didn't have a uterus. So I didn't, so I knew I wouldn't be able to carry. Right. Okay, yes, so you had your saved ovaries, my but you didn't ovaries, have your uterus. My okay, got yeah, it. So, so I knew I couldn't carry. Okay, and honestly, I didn't know a lot about anything back mm-hmm. then. You know, it mm-hmm. wasn't something that we had looked into a tremendous amount. And I think it was one Sunday we were watching. I want to say it was like the CBS Morning Show, and they had a segment on surrogacy, mm-hmm. and it sort of piqued our interest a little bit, and started to look into it. I mean, back in the days, you know, early, the early days of online research in 2008, um, right. there was not a ton, and there was not a lot out there. Like I think, right. you know, surrogacy is much more well-known now than it was then. And even now I still think not a lot of people know about it or even talk about it, but this was 2008. Right. I mean, there was not a lot, there were barely any surrogacy agencies back then. Mm-hmm. And I actually think it was Circle Surrogacy who was featured on the morning show. Oh, wow. Um, that we were watching. I know. So That's I so cool. Kind of, I know. I looked them up and we sort of started the research process. And again, it wasn't a super involved research process because there wasn't really a lot to compare. Right. But we reached out and we made an appointment to meet with, with Circle just to talk about surrogacy and, and yeah. what that was what that meant and what it was so like. And how did you, was. how did you feel knowing that that was the the route that you were going to go down? Did you have any sort of grieving that you weren't going to be able to carry yourself? You know, what was that process like in accepting kind of these next steps for you guys, both you and your husband? Yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, you know, for, I know for my husband, his first thing was my health. Yeah. And I think it was easier for us to know that, somebody else would be carrying because we, we sort of knew that going in, it was not something that we were trying to do on our own. And then all of a sudden had to face and make some decisions. We knew if we ever wanted to do this, that we were going to need help. Mm -hmm. So I think that made sort of that transition easier for us because we just knew from my history, that that was something that we needed to do. I think for me, it was probably a little bit more practical like that. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. this is this in sort of just looking at it methodically, right? Like, okay. This is what's happened. This is yep. kind of where we are. If we yeah. want to get to the next step, like this is what we need to do. And so okay. we just kind of went in blind yeah. and embarked on this journey. Okay. So what happened next? What was the what were the next steps that you guys took? So the first thing we did, we reached out to Circle, <clears throat> scheduled a meeting with them. They were doing some consultations uh in New York. We happened to live in Connecticut at the time. So we took the train to New York. We went to the hotel where they were doing consultations. We met with um, the founder of Circle and somebody else on the sort of their parent team. And we sat there for, I want to say, two to two and a half hours. And they talked about the surrogacy process and I don't even think we asked that many questions. Like it was just so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. My husband and I walked out of the hotel across the street to the bar and just went and like, we just had to go. I'm like, we, I need a drink. Like, yeah, I can't even even begin to digest all of this. Like we just sort of stumbled in a daze uh, across the street. What were your main takeaways from the meeting? Like, what do you, what do you remember that sticking with you the most? I think what the process entailed, it is a, it's a big undertaking. There's a lot of professionals involved. 
medical and billing. And then honestly, like, holy cow, the cost. That was, right. that was a big, it was a big takeaway. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we're in our early thirties and mm-hmm. to hear, you know, price tags of a hundred and whatever, twenty forty thousand $40,000 at the time. Right. We were like, how are we, how are we going to do this? Absolutely. Yeah. How so what did you it? think about that? Like, was it like, okay, we're going to have to take out a loan or get a, you know, like what was the the thought process financially? So I think <clears throat> for us, we are, so my husband and I are both only children. Mm-hmm. And my husband I is think, too. Yeah. So I think, you know, we got to the point, you know, in our relationship and our marriage where we were sort of like, I think we want to grow our family, you know, because it was just sort of the two of us, our, our parents had just us, Mm -hmm. um, by nature of being only children, we're very close with our parents. And we were now living back in Connecticut where we were from, Mm -hmm. you know, we lived about three miles from each set of parents. So we were all very close. We spent all of our holidays together. So we're really a close knit group. And they were really the only ones that knew what we were doing. And we were lucky enough that they were able to help us a little bit financially, Mm -hmm. you know, because, I, you know, at the end of the day, like we were their only shot at grandchildren. And, you know, I think that's something that they were excited about. And if they could help, they wanted to because, you know, they wanted to be grandparents, too, you know. Um, So we sort of just kind of kept it with them. You know, I was at a new job since I had had my surgery and nobody, nobody at my job knew, nobody knew what I went through. Nobody knew I had cancer. It just didn't come up. It it happened almost in like my, my previous life. So to all of a sudden say, Hey, we're going to do surrogacy. I think people would have been like, wait, what? Like what's going right. on? So we really didn't talk about it and not because we were embarrassed or ashamed. And it wasn't that at all. It was I just didn't want to go into the backstory if yeah. I didn't have to right then and there. And we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. It was so early on. That makes um, sense. So we we basically came back from New York, shared everything with our parents, and they were very supportive. You know, if this is something that you want to do, you know, we're 100% behind you, which was great because it was sort of the support that we needed because little did we know we had a really long journey ahead. So, okay. What happened next, Kristen? So we decided to move forward and we signed on with Circle Mm -hmm. in, I want to say, December of 2008. It was the end of 2008. Okay. Or it might have been early 2009. Mm -hmm. Um, We received the paperwork that was 40 pages of what felt like legalese. Right. Were you like, wow, what is this? Yeah, like I was a- like, I I am not prepared for this. Um, <clears throat> so, but we had a great uh, we had a great support system at the agency. Um, you know, legally, that you know, lawyers on staff that sort of help you through everything. So that was good. Mm-hmm. We're finally all signed on, and we were waiting for a surrogate match. And you know, back then, like we were noobs, like we didn't we didn't know the deal or anything. So when they asked what we were looking for in a surrogate, I was like, hey, I want somebody who lives close by Mm -hmm. so I can go to the appointments. Like Mm -hmm. that was my, that was really important to me. And, you know, now after being in the surrogacy world, you know, Mm -hmm. not as an intended parent, like, and even after having gone through it, like it doesn't matter where your surrogate is. Like Mm -hmm. you are going to develop a relationship and have a bond whether she's an hour away or two plane rides away. Right. Especially Um, with all the technology now, right? I mean, this wasn't a big thing back in 2008, but now it's like FaceTime and Zoom and all that stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So um, it was, I want to say it was May. I was sitting at work in a meeting, scrolling through emails Mm -hmm. on my BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I miss (laughs) the BlackBerry. BlackBerry was cool. Right? I'm a BlackBerry and I see an email came in with like possible surrogate match as the subject line. And my heart was, and of course now I'm in a meeting with people who have no idea what's going on. And I am just like, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Right. So I like excuse myself phone in hand um, because I just had to read the email and it was a profile of a potential surrogate match who lived in Massachusetts um, which was great. I was in Connecticut. 
And I called my husband and I'm like, check your email. Like we have, you know, so the next step was that we would have a, if all looked good in her profile. Um, and then our profile was also shared with her mm-hmm. um, because we, there, there needs to be sort of a mutual, like, yep, I'd love to meet this person. And right. she felt the same way we did. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a call. Um, <clears throat> it was, I think it was a phone call. Now they're all video calls. I think it was a phone call for, there was a reason why it was a phone call, not a video call. And I don't remember what it was, but we had a phone call and we talked for a while and sort of got to know each other and decided that, yes, like we want to move, we want to move forward. And so at that point we were considered matched and we could sort of start the whole IVF process with her and with me to create embryos okay. and start moving forward. It was very surreal. Yeah. Um, it was still a, I still can't believe this is real. I like, even though there's now a human, a person, a name, pictures, right. I've talked to this person. It totally. still didn't feel real. Yeah. So interesting that, is this how it normally works or was this how it was in 2008 where you didn't do the IVF process or the retrieval process and already start with embryos? Like, you know, I was curious what the, think, the order was. Like you got the surrogacy match first and then worked on the embryos. Do some people do it differently now or has it changed? Yes. It's, okay. it's done differently now. So okay. honestly, sometimes intended parents will come to surrogacy and they already have embryos. Like they've already gone through that process. They've been trying to get pregnant on their own without success, but they have embryos. So mm-hmm. they need to match with a surrogate. So in that case, they already have embryos created. If you do need to make embryos and match with a surrogate, um, I could speak for Circle that they will have you. It's sort of like a parallel path as you're waiting for a surrogate match. They will have you right. create your embryos. Yeah. Okay. Um, whether that's matching with an egg donor or not. Um, Got it. Some intended mothers use their own eggs. So yeah. So the process is a little different, and I can tell you that the matching process was a lot faster back then because mm. not as many people were doing surrogacy. Mm-hmm. Um. So it, it was a relatively quick match and we sort of started moving forward and we did our first embryo transfer and it stuck. With Tim Horton's two hot breakfast sandwiches for six bucks deal, you can mix and match your favorites. Mix and match between savory sausage or naturally hickory smoked bacon. Mix and match between an English muffin or flaky biscuit. Any two served with a freshly cracked egg and melted cheese. You can even mix and match how you share it. One for you, one for them. Two for them or two just for you. There's no wrong way to mix and match this tasty deal. Two breakfast sandwiches for just six bucks. It's time for Tim's. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Single item at regular price. Modifications and tax extra. Additional terms apply. Wow. And Wait, backing up a little. Sorry. How was the process yeah. for with uh, the, you know, the retrieval and everything for you? Uh, well, it was it was a little rough for me. Um, so normally egg retrievals are done vaginally and it's a relatively easy process because of my surgery and the fact that the doctor had sort of moved, pinned, she called it pinned, mm-hmm. sort of pinned my ovaries up. They had to do my egg retrieval topically. Okay. So literally they were using um, an ultrasound wand to sort of see all of the follicles on my ovaries. And they were literally going in one at a time with a needle. Wow. That's so to cool. To retrieve the eggs. It's cool and painful at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was, that Are was Are you under difficult. anesthesia for this? Like, was it different than regular retrieval? I was, I know a, it's I was awake. Okay. I was awake and I could feel it. Mm-hmm. I could definitely feel it. I mean, it probably didn't feel as bad as it would if I had nothing, but I could definitely feel that somebody was sticking something in my stomach. Oh my for gosh. Sure. I know. So we do the egg retrieval, we create our embryos, we do our embryo transfer and it sticks Wow. Wow. And so this is 2009. Okay. And we're over the moon, but we are still very, very nervous. We're very, very cautious. And we still didn't tell anybody Okay, um, that this was going on. So, yeah. you know, how I many embryos be, did you come away with? I don't remember. It okay. was so long ago. No, I, I know. apologize. That's a hundred years um, ago. It was a hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so here we are not telling anybody what we're doing. I'm getting clinic phone calls at work and, you know, trying to hide in an office and talk to them and, you know, things are moving along. And 
<clears throat> we got to, I want to say a 16 week appointment and um, our surrogate came down uh, from Massachusetts to our clinic here in Connecticut. And, you know, because I was of advanced maternal age, when they did my egg retrieval, nobody makes you feel old. Like <laughs> you had a geriatric procedure. Ger- yes. yes. I know. Like I'm 80. I'm uh-huh. like people I'm in my thirties here. Exactly. Um, so we were at the advanced maternal center and she was mm-hmm. sort of being checked out and the doctor sort of noticed like something wasn't great. And it, you know, the baby just, it was not, there were going to be I think it was heart issues and it just wasn't like developing the right way. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. And so we ended up, it was, we were about four months along and oh. yeah. So we had to do a DNC. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So that was, that was rough. That was, you know, things had been going so smoothly up until that point. And here we are. And, you know, the first thing I thought of is, oh, thank God. God, we didn't tell a lot of people because Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would go back and tell them this now. So as hard as it was not being able to share this with a lot of people, we were, you know, the fact that we were going through this and that we were grieving this, um, you know, we were just grieving like quietly and silently and, and nobody around us, our friends, like nobody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So that was hard. But at the same time, I was, I was grateful that we didn't you know, have to just share the bad news yeah. over and over. Obviously yeah, our parents that's, knew and, right. and we shared it can be them. exhausting to have to tell that story again and again. Yeah. So we, um, we took a little bit of time to kind of think through what next steps were, but we did decide that we wanted to try it again. Mm-hmm. So we did another embryo transfer mm-hmm. X amount of months later and that didn't work. Mm. Was and it, then, were you going to work with the same surrogate? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Got it. Per contract, we can do up to three embryo transfers with her. Okay. Got so it. the second one didn't work. And then the third one also did not work. So what were you feeling mentally at this point? I was just, after having gone through the first time and everything worked perfectly the first time to go back and have it not work well the second time and the third time it it was devastating and honestly you know I was again like we were going on life as usual but like all this stuff is going on in the background that nobody knows about right and I'll never forget I was in a meeting I was on a client call I was doing a presentation and presenting creative ideas to mm-hmm. our client. Mm-hmm. And I can see in my lap, my phone ringing and it's the clinic. And it was the day that she was going for her beta blood test. Mm-hmm. And I had been waiting all day for this phone call. Mm. And I see it coming through on my lap and note. And honestly, like, I, it was like, ton, no joke. I was like, excuse me, I have to step out first. Like literally in the middle of the presentation, I was wow. like, I have to, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I have to, I have to do this. I have to go take this call. Yes. And I walked out of the room, answered. The nurse was like, we're so sorry, her beta. And I'm like, okay, thank you. And I hung up the phone and I walked back into the room and I sat down and I just picked up where I was. Oh my gosh. Presenting. You are incredible and that you was, were able to do that. I mean, it was awful, but I was just, it was power through power through, right? That's what you got to do. You got to power through. Wow. Yeah. So we're probably in 2010 now. Okay. We could be 2011. The the years kind of blur a little Mm -hmm. bit. We kind of took a little bit of a break. We wanted to take a step back financially Mm -hmm. as well as emotionally Mm -hmm. and just sort of assess the situation. We still wanted this very, very badly, but honestly, Mm -hmm. there were conversations to be had, like how far are we willing to go and how Mm -hmm. much can we spend? And so, but there was just part of us that were like, but what if it's the next one? I know there's the next one. Oh my God. I know you, you just, it's like, you almost feel like you're 
quitting without really giving it a chance. But I mean, you never know it, you know, there's so many what ifs in this process, no matter what road you're going. So down, many right? what ifs. Mm-hmm. I know. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so this was now we're like 2011, 2012, maybe we honestly, I want to say we took a good long break. It might've been even for at least a year mm-hmm. where and circle was great. They're like, we'll just put everything on hold. Mm -hmm. And you just let us know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Were you able to kind of get back to yourself during that break? And like, you know, I know sometimes when you're going through this process, whether it be surrogacy or IVF or adoption or fostering or whatever, you just get tunnel vision. I know I did. And, you know, it's like, I need this. I want this. I want this. I want this. So were you able to kind of step aside from that? We were. And I think it's what we needed to do you know, kind of just, we ended up moving houses during that time and we were renovating a house. So that took up a lot of energy and mind space and sort of took our minds off of things. And, you know, we finally got to the place where we're in, now we're in this new house and it's like, all right, I think now we're ready to sort of continue on with this journey. Mm -hmm. Um, But something just wasn't working. So in talking with Circle, they suggested maybe you try a new clinic and then um, why don't we do a test with your surrogate just to make sure everything is going to be okay. So we ended up changing clinics. Okay. And we had our surrogate sort of undergo a test at the new clinic and the doctor called and he was basically like, she's never going to get pregnant. And this was devastating news to us because wow. we had grown very close to her. We were so invested in her. She was so invested with us. And honestly, she had stuck with us. She, I mean, you know, we're in it because we want a baby, but, you know, a surrogate, a woman who wants to be a surrogate, she goes into surrogacy because she wants to have a baby for somebody. She wants to be able to give that gift. And so far with us, she hadn't been able to do that yet. And we had gone through sort of our three transfers with her sort of per our contract. She had agreed and signed on that she would do more with us because she was, she's like, I really want to help you. I want to help you grow your family. Yeah. And it got to the point where all of a sudden they were like, she can't help you. And it was very hard for us. It was very hard for her Mm -hmm. to hear that news. Um, So it took a little bit to sort of process that. And then we had to make a decision like, okay, we had decided we were going to move forward again with a new clinic. Now do we decide we're going to move forward again and be rematched with a new surrogate? And we weren't ready to give up yet. We still had that just in the back of our heads and the back of our hearts that like, it's not the end yet. Like it's Mm -hmm. just, you know, I'm like, I think we got one more in us. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, my husband and I, like, we really leaned on each other through all of this. And we were such a great support for each other. And I think it made us stronger because we were going through this together. So we decided to forge on again. We were rematched with a new surrogate. Now knowing and being a little bit more uh, savvy as to surrogacy, our new surrogate lived in Georgia. Um, I wasn't adamant that she lived within a two hour drive of me anymore. Right. And she was lovely. She and her husband lived in Georgia. He was in the Navy. She had um, two kids of her own and she just really wanted to help somebody grow their family. And so we exchanged profiles. We thought she looked great. She thought we looked great. She probably felt really sorry for us. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So we had a video call. And we met her and her husband and her son at the time, her daughter was still pretty little. And we decided to move forward. Um, And this was in 2013. Mm -hmm. She came up to our new clinic in Connecticut for her medical screening. Um, That looked great. We went out to lunch with them and spent some time just chatting and Mm -hmm. and getting to know them. Um, It was sort of the first time she had been up in the Northeast And, you know, so she, and it was getting, starting to get cold and they came back, uh, she came back with her aunt for her embryo transfer and, um, we transferred two embryos. They weren't the best of qualities, which is why we transferred two, um, just hoping one would stick. 
and we waited, God, those two weeks, that was a two week wait. That was a long, and she kept asking like, do you want me to take a test? And I just, and I said, no, cause I just felt like she was going to jinx it if she took a test. And I'm like, I want the blood test. I want the official, you know, the official, um, the official results. So on the day she went for her beta, usually they go very early in the morning, you know, 7 a.m. And usually by the end of the day, you get your results. Mm-hmm. So that day was probably one of the longest in our lives. Oh, definitely. Waiting. Yeah. And, you know, I was working at a very busy creative agency. We mm-hmm. were in the middle of a new business pitch. So I actually had a lot of go- lot going on at work. So my mind was like somewhat preoccupied. Mm-hmm. But all day, it's like looking at the watch. Looking totally. At the watch, looking right. at the watch. It's like three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. And I hadn't heard a thing. And now I'm like, well, now the clinic's probably closed. It's right. five o'clock. Yeah. Nobody called me. So it turned out we were working on this new business pitch. We had to stay late. So at that point, I was just deflated. I'm like, I have to stay late at work. I haven't gotten this call. I have to spend another day waiting. So I was kind of, I kind of shut my door in my office and I kind of was just sitting there like quietly and somebody's like, Hey, I need to talk to you. So I go out to look at something and I came back and I had a missed call. Oh God. I know it's like, and I listened to the message and it was, Hey, this is so-and-so from the clinic. It was like, your sorry gets pregnant. Ah! And her beta was blah, 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 whatever it was. And I just, I was, it was shock. And I still have that message. I just got Um, the chills. It's on, it's on, I think an iPhone four that I just cannot part with. I know. And I haven't like done the brain damage of like, copying it to the cloud. Or I was whatever just going to say, keep it. it. Yes, I'm just hanging it. on to the phone. I'm like, do we even have a charger for this anymore? Because this right. has the message. Oh my God. Um, how cool. Oh, I know. And I called, I called my husband right away. And then I called our surrogate right away. And she had known, and she knew the clinic was calling us and she's like, Oh my God, I couldn't wait for you to call me. She's So, I mean, that was amazing news to get. And because we transferred to embryos, when we finally did the second beta, her beta numbers were really high and Mm -hmm. she was pregnant with twins. Okay. And so that was a like, wait, what, you know, and, you know, overwhelming, but at the same time, I was a little like, I think it would be great to have two because then we don't have to go through this again. (laughs) Totally. I've heard so many people say that and I know exactly what you mean. Being two only children, I was like, great. Like built in sibling, this built is in be bestie, amazing. yeah, built in bestie. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, I think it was our six week appointment that they noticed that one baby A was growing much more than baby B. Baby B just sort of started to shrink a little bit, not have a heartbeat. Baby A was thriving and just growing strong and, and mm-hmm. where he should be. Mm-hmm. Um, And so we lost, well, I'll do air quotes around lost. It was still very, very early. Um, Twin B, Mm -hmm. Um, but baby A just went on to grow and be born three weeks early at eight pounds and 12 ounces. So he was a very big boy. (laughs) Did you know the genders of the the embryos that you guys had transferred? Mm-mm. No. Okay. Wow. All right. No. So baby boy. Um, but we did find out at the 20 week, at the 20 week scan. That was, I am not good with surprises. Like I'm basically like, tell me what I need to know. I want to know, you know, I got a plan. I'm a planner. I got to right. know what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. No surprises. I've had enough surprises. Like I just want to go and know what's, what's going on. Right. Totally. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's exciting. It was crazy. So she had a very uneventful pregnancy. Great. Just what you want. What we want. Um, We went, we flew down for the 20 week uh, gender sort of reveal ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the doctor was like, hmm, something's not looking right with one of these kidneys. You need to go see a high risk specialist. So we go now. So now we're there and I'm like, we're flying home tomorrow. Like you got to get us in. We have to see this person today. So Unfortunately, what was supposed to be a very exciting celebratory 20 week scan, we're now nervous that Mm -hmm. something is wrong with the baby and the way the kidneys are developing. Mm -hmm. Um, So we see the high risk 
OB. And basically one of the baby's kidneys was growing just fine. And the other one just wasn't. It was something that they monitored through the rest of the pregnancy and that we've continued to monitor since he's been born every year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's not a life-threatening thing. He has one kidney that works perfectly well. And mm-hmm. it's funny because they're like, your son has a kidney the size of a 25-year-old woman. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm like, well, it's pulling double duty. Like, it Yes, has to be strong, absolutely. Right? So how old is he now? He is eight. Okay. And honestly, the eight have gone by in a blur. Yeah. Um, it's hard to believe. Next year for me is 20 years cancer-free, which is also wow, crazy Kristen, to believe. That's amazing. I know. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And it was it was a long journey. We we were probably one of Circle's longest journeys, um, partially because we did some starts and stops to clinics, to surrogates. But I want to say our total journey, we started in 2008 and he was born in 2014. Right. So were you just like, I might as well just work here now? <laughs> like, how did that whole thing happen? <laughs> I know, right? It wasn't that seamless. So <clears throat> he was born in 2014. Okay, I was still working at my crazy creative agency that just mm-hmm. sucks up all of your time mm-hmm. and energy. I had probably a two to three hour, uh, hour commute every day. Oh, wow. So here I have like this baby and this one-year-old at home. And I'm like, God, I'm spending all of this time in the car. Like, this is not, I'm mm-hmm. away all the time. Mm-hmm. So um I had kept in touch with Circle. Um, yeah, I'm a, my my background is writing, so I had written blog posts for them, yeah. and I had sent them updates. I mean, God, they were like part of our lives now. I mean, they right, like six years, totally. Um, and just, can like, I ask, Kristen, did you know at that point yeah. your family was complete after you'd had your son? Were you guys we felt like, complete? We felt okay. complete at that point. Yeah. And after everything we had been through, it wasn't like let's jump in and do it again. Like right. that was not. The mentality. I think it was like, great, let's get to know this little person mm-hmm. and figure out what it's like to be a parent. Because you know, even though we pre- we were preparing for six years, we still knew zero things. Totally, um, you never know, right? You're never ready, right? Oh, You're never no, ready, never. Um, and then once you get it, they totally change, and you have to like start from scratch on the next phase, right? Mm-hmm. So once you master one thing, mm-hmm. so I had kept in touch with Circle. I had done some writing for them. And I was just getting to a point where I was ready to make a change in my career. So I happened to reach out to them and I'm like, hey, do you ever have any need for somebody like me, you know, on your marketing team or whatever it might be? And, you know, I I kind of like to to joke about it with uh, some of the, the folks at Circle that I literally interviewed for the job three different times over two years and finally they hired me. And I'm like, what took you so long? <laughs> so I was, and even then they were like, we're sorry. Like, we, right. you know, interview, hire someone else. That person doesn't work out. Interview, oh my hire God. someone else, that person. Then finally, I'm like, I'm still here and yeah. I forgive you and I will come and work. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> so I came on board as their marketing director in 2017. So I've been there a little over five years now. Yeah. And I work remotely. <clears throat> which is great. So I'm, mm-hmm. you know, obviously our son is off in school all day, but I'm not in a car three hours a day and right. I'm able to be present. And it's, I can't tell you how fulfilling it is to work in this space after having gone through it and just having that personal experience, you know, talking to intended parents and surrogates, you know, coming from a place of like, I've been there, like, you know, hearing like, why does it cost so much money? And I'm like, girl, I know, like it, it does. 100%. Like, and I, I, I can't make it right. And I can't make you afford it. I can only tell you that it's worth every penny if you can get there, but it's just, honestly, it's just so rewarding. Just, yeah. you know, every page I write on the website and everything I, I create, know. it's coming from a place of just like, passion and experience and love. And yeah, I, I it, just it, it's help palpable. You and I feel the same way about this podcast and about fertility rally and the things that I've been doing too. It's like coming from having gone through it myself and now being able to work and invest all your passion and your time and creativity and all that into this yeah. field is it's like, there's nothing better. So I totally know what you mean with that. So before we wrap, Kristen, tell me 
what do you know about the surrogacy process now being in the, you know, the, the OG at circle surrogacy, basically, what do you know now that you wish that you knew then for people who are listening, who might be just getting started with the surrogacy process or just want to know more? Yeah. Great question. So I think I touched upon it a little bit when I was sort of sharing our, our story that I think the first inclination for, you know, an intended parent or even a surrogate is I have to find an agency that's close to me. I have to find someone that is geographically near me. And I can honestly tell you, no, you don't. I think when you're looking for a surrogacy agency, you should pick the agency that's the right fit for you, no matter where they're located, because you will never go to your agency. The only place you're going is your clinic. And that usually by, by you know, just by the treatments and whatever is probably close to where you live anyway. Your agency can be anywhere. Your surrogate can be anywhere because mm -hmm. you are going to, there are so many ways to keep in touch now. So it doesn't matter where your surrogate lives, where your agency is, you're not going to travel there. You mm -hmm. are only going to go to your clinic. You are going to create such a bond with your surrogate just by regular methods, FaceTime, video chats, texting, emails. Mm -hmm. You'll see not Blackberry though. RIP. Not Blackberry. the Blackberry. We need to bring right. it back. The dial up internet. <laughs> <laughs> but you will form that bond and you don't need to be next door to each other. She could be 17 states away and you will you will have a fulfilling surrogacy experience. I think the other thing that's important is when it comes to costs. Surrogacy is expensive. Um, there's a lot of professionals involved and they are all working together to give you the most seamless, successful, secure journey possible. One thing that was not available to us when we went through our journey was a fixed cost. So every time something happened, we had to pay out of pocket, pay out of pocket. Pay. So it was very hard for us to sort of plan financially for how much it was going to cost. You know, I obviously, I know Circle intimately working there. And I know, you know, one thing that Circle offers is like a fixed cost program that is like an all-inclusive price. And good God, do I wish that existed when we were doing our journey, because basically they can say to intended parents, Here's how much it's going to cost. And intended parents can say, but what if I have to rematch? It's covered. What if she has a miscarriage? It's covered. What if she has to go on bed rest? It's covered. Like literally everything mm -hmm. is included. So you mm -hmm. can go in. It's sticker shock. I'm not going to lie. It's sticker shock. Mm -hmm. But you can go in saying like, at least I can plan for this. Right. And I don't have to, you know, six yeah. months in something happens and it's like, hey, we need another 20 five thousand dollars i mean because that that just guts you at that point right like right you're sailing along and then all of a sudden you're like oh like how am i going to do that mm -hmm. so yeah. i mean i think i think finding the right agency that feels right no matter where it is mm -hmm. is 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 first and you know just knowing knowing your costs and and mm -hmm. being able to plan for them i think right are the two two biggies and honestly like there's never the perfect time like just you, you got to If you want to do it, you just got to jump in and do it. OK, my friends, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to Kristen for sharing her story. Guys, definitely check out Circle Surrogacy if you're interested in going down that road or are going down that road and need some more information. They are awesome. I've been working with them since the jump of this podcast. Also check out Fertility Rally if you need a community, a safe space where everybody's welcome. This is the place Blair Nelson and I co-created because we wanted something that wasn't out there yet. And now it is. And we've got over 500 members globally and it's just amazing. So please reach out to us if you're interested in joining our family 
We are online at fertilityrally.com. You can check out our site or you can check out our Instagram at Fertility Rally. You can DM us if you have any questions. Our membership opens the first week of every month. So you can get on the wait list now and then we will send you a reminder when we open up. And as always, if you have any questions or need anything, you can also reach out to me at Infertile AF Stories on Instagram. So thanks for listening. Thanks again to Kristen and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you.